Well, welcome to Vineyard Community Church. So glad that you can join us today online. Glad to have you. We're in the last part of our series we've been doing, Not Afraid. Well, there's certainly a lot these days to be concerned about. It can be difficult to have a cheerful, positive outlook, even if that's your temperament, because of all of the the things that have been going on. You know, one of the biggest challenges is just all the change. Change is difficult even when it's good change, but certainly when it's bad change or, or, or things that uh, certainly feel like they're uh, putting us at a disadvantage, putting us on our heels, that can even be more difficult. Now, we're looking at different futures based on what experts say that go one direction or go a different direction. And that causes us even more frustration. We don't know what, uh, we're in change, but there's going to be more change and we don't know what it's going to look like. Certainly, if you talk to uh, the scientific community, epidemiologists, they will say, a lot of them will say, hey, we're going to be experiencing a lot of negative change. That's what they're predicting. They're saying that this will, there will be a resurgence uh, maybe in the early summer. Most of them say certainly in the fall. And, and, uh, and they're saying that a, a treatment is probably a long way off. And a vaccine is a long way off, many are saying. I mean, the average vaccine takes 10 years to develop. So they're saying, don't get your hopes up. Plan for this to be around for a long time. Other, albeit less, other scientists are saying something a little more positive. They're saying, no, we will have a vaccine within a year or 18 months. I mean, it, it's not going to be uh, as bad as, as, as some people are saying. And then the same thing happens, like, for example, in economics. You have financial experts that are saying, that because we're printing trillions of dollars and, and passing it out for stimulus money and uh, because of the interest rates that will come and the, 20, and the 36 million people that have been laid off due to the coronavirus, that that has not taken its toll yet. And they're very bearish on the economic outlook for our country and how it's going to affect us. Other economists and financial advisors Say, or saying, no, maybe another quarter or at most two, and we're going to see this uh, either sharp U or even a V uh, turnaround where we're going to uh, see blue skies and, and arrows up and to the right. It's all going to be really, really good. So you have different futures that are being painted. That causes some stress. It causes uh, not even knowing what kind of change. We know change is coming, but it's hard to prepare for both of those. Our governor, Governor Northam, is, has tried to respond to some of that. And, and so he's slowly rolling our, our, our state into phase one. And so we're all in phase one now. And that has been a slow rollout in different parts of the state. He's opened up the beaches uh, two weeks ago. Gyms are opening up this coming week. Uh, he's, you know, th he's rolling that out, and churches are part of that. Churches, he said, can meet, and then has said, but facial coverings and 50% capacity and some other restrictions that go into that, and we're trying to in embrace that. We're walking into that, recognizing God's got a mission for us. We certainly want to be responsible and do our part within our community to be part of the solution, not part of the problem, whether perceived or not, and so all of that's part of that. And taking precautions is, 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 part of our, is part of what we do for good, wise management. King Artaxerxes, back in Persia, years ago, he was the king during the Babylonian exile when the Israelites were in Babylon and they were exiled there. And, and, and so he was trying to make decisions based on data that he had. Now, he had some stumbles up front, but he really played a vital role in... Ezra and, the, uh, and, and a number of the, the, the Jewish leaders and the Jews to go back and start rebuilding the temple. And, and here's what he says. It says, be diligent and take precautions so that you do not neglect your responsibility in this matter. Now he's talking about uh, these, the, the process of them going back and, and, and says, hey, make sure you do your due diligence. Now he had some poor data at front, as I mentioned. And so we've experienced the same thing. We're trying to be precautious. We're trying to, to be diligent as a, as a country and certainly as our church. And we've had data changed based on new scientific evidence. Let me give you one example. Out of the CDC, they were saying that the coronavirus can live three days 
uh, on surfaces and is a, one of the primary ways that uh, its transmission happens. And now they made a change that says it may be possible that a person can get COVID-19 by touching a surface. So that hasn't changed, right? Or an object that has the virus on it and then touching their mouth or their nose or their eyes. But now notice, here's the change. This is not thought to be the main way the virus spreads. So that's a big change. They're saying, hey, we're not saying it's not an issue. We're saying it's not really the main issue anymore. So based on changing data, there's different ways that we prepare. Now, Paul, we see, uh, he was interested in being prepared as well. He's talking to the church. His issue that he was dealing with is there was a famine in Jerusalem. He was doing a missionary journey, and he was collecting an offering along the way, and he wanted to make sure that that was uh, properly watched over, stewarded well, spent well. And so what he says to the church is he says, we are taking this precaution so that no one can criticize us. He says, that's, there's value in that. He knows he's doing a job, good job, but he wants to go above and beyond, have the precautions in place so that anyone who might observe them or be part of that would have no reason to criticize them. And of course, he's talking about money in this situation. But for us, it would be the coronavirus. We have this environment we're living in. We want to make sure and do our precautions. And our motivation is always because we want to do the loving thing. It's what Christ would want us to do. Love always protects. Always, always, always protects. And so we want to look for ways that we can protect one another. We can protect people that come and join our community, that come and visit, that are seeking God. We want to always have a place where people can say, Vineyard Community Church, is doing everything they need to do. They're taking out all, they're doing all the precautions. They're doing all the due diligence in order to make sure myself, my family, my kids will be safe. And so that certainly is our commitment to you. But it will look different. I mean, there's, if you've been going to our church previous, when you come back, it will look and feel different because we are really fundamentally in a different environment. And there's things that cause us to be frustrated things and a lot of us have experienced frustration just in the last uh, three months right with the coronavirus one is is interruptions we have interruptions in uh, in our lives if you're a grandparent and you weren't able to visit your grandkids that was an interruption certainly caused a lot of frustration it's changing your life and it's causing frustration there's students that now had to take uh, all these online you know, classes and finish online or maybe couldn't graduate or couldn't take the SAT that they needed to get into a college and all the kinds of interruptions or businesses had to close. That's a very frustrating interruption. And of course, people who lost their job, very, very uh, frustrating because of that interruption. Then you have inconveniences. The inconvenience of the fireworks show for 4th of July has been canceled. That's an inconvenience. You have the inconvenience that the gym that you like to go to is closed or your favorite restaurant is not, you can't go to right now or you can only do takeout and it's not the same. And, you know, we just have all of the inconveniences that we've experienced. And then there's just flat out irritations. A week ago, I wanted to visit my mom. She lives in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, so I decided to fly out there. Very, very irritating. The night before I flew out, my flight was canceled. I had to totally rearrange it. Uh, it, it, it added extra hubs that I had to go to. It was, uh, then I, of course, I had to wear, you know, a mask and, and gloves and, and, and goggles and everybody else is around and, and, and the flights are 85% full. It felt like 100%, but evidently, I guess the, the, uh, the FAA is 85%, but it's packed. Everybody's in that. There's no, you know, you don't get water, you don't get snacks. I mean, you're just like, just going through very, very difficult. And then taking an Uber to my mom's house. And then leaving, it was, it was even more difficult. The night before, I got a text from the airline I was using saying my flight was delayed. That caused me to miss my flight, my connecting flight. And that was the only day after that, uh, it was going to be two days to get home. Two days. I had to stay uh, in one of these hub airports at my own expense, at a hotel, all the meals, nothing else is paid for. I have to do it all. And it takes me two days to get home. In order to get home on a single day, I had to go up to the airport, get a rental car, drive to Phoenix. I got three hours sleep that night, got into, a, you know, into my flight that had no seat assignment and I'm in the back. It just, I'll tell you, that's irritating. So we've all experienced 
irritations over the last three months. Will that go away uh, just in, in, in a few weeks? Probably not, right? We're going to have a, a number of irritations that go forward. Now, when we have those frustration experiences, what are our typical reactions? Well, one is to resist it, to just be angry, to be upset, to blow your stack, to just come unglued, or anger turned inward is depression. And certainly there's plenty of people that have experienced depression. Honestly, I've had moments where I just feel depressed. I don't even, that's not my typical nature, but all of a sudden I feel myself, well, I'm just really depressed, kind of like a sad and, and it just, that's the way often we respond to frustration. We just get so upset or we turn it inward and we get, we get depressed. We, we, we fall into that, that hole. Another way is to resent it. We're just angry. Oh, you know, we look for somebody to blame. Let's blame the Republicans, blame the Democrats. Let's, you know, all, all, it's because of the Chinese that this is happening. And we, uh, you know, I can't go on my dating site if you're single and I can't date right now. It's interrupting that or it's interrupting uh, things, my normal lifestyle that I, that I was living. And, and all of that can cause us a lot of resentment or you just resign to it. You just kind of grin and bear it. Suck it up. Walk it, you know, just kind of like, well, this is, where I, this is what I have to do and kind of take on a victim mindset. Uh, Mary martyr, you know, and, 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 and the, this is the person who just says, woe is me and throws a pity party. That are, those are common ways we handle frustration or do we just reduce it. This is what I recommend is to reduce it. How do you reduce a frustration in your life? Well, it's really to get a different perspective. That's why we go to God. We go to God. We get up in the morning. And my suggestion is, because when you sleep, you're kind of rebooting. It's a new day. The Bible talks about each day, God's mercies are new. So it's a new day. And when you decide at the beginning of each day what you're going to focus on. And so if you go right to social media, if you go right to the news, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm going to let the world set the agenda for my day and my perspective. But God, when we go to his word, he sets. We start to then, we start there and then we start to see everything else from his perspective. Look at what he says here. He says, for no wonder we don't give up. For even though our outer person gradually wears out, our inner being is renewed every single day. Every day is a new day. And you get to choose, will I renew this day? Will I renew my mind? And say, God is in charge I'm not a victim. This thing's not wildly out of control. God's my source. He's my provider. He's my healer. Renewed every single day. We view our slight, short-lived troubles in the light of eternity. Now, this regardless of the predictions of the people who, whether they're economists or epidemiologists, he says, no, when you're looking at it from, from God's perspective, it's short-lived troubles. Doesn't matter how long it goes on. Doesn't matter what the future looks like or what kind of change is coming. See, that's the perspective we have to reduce it. We see our difficulties as the substance that produces for us eternal weighty glory far beyond comparison because we don't focus our attention on what is seen. So what are you focusing your attention on? If you want God to do something in your life, he says, we're, it's changing us. It's God's using all of those things to make us more like he wants us to be. And he says, it's all about what your attention is on. If it's on the seen or the unseen. And here's what he says. He goes, for what is seen is temporary. So what we see today, what you see on the news, what you see in social media, the blogs, that's temporary. But the unseen, unseen realm is eternal. That's God's word, recognizing God has a perspective. And so we refocus. God, I want you in my life. And that's where peace comes, how we focus. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose what? Mind is stayed on thee. When you stay your mind, when you say, God, I'm going to allow you into my mind. I'm going to focus on that. I'm going to filter all of the things I get, what I read and what I watch on TV, all the things I hear on the, on the radio, all of that gets filtered. God says, I'm going to give you peace. Now, change is inevitable. Change is inevitable. How do we find peace through change? Well, let me give you four things. Number one, accept that change happens. Change is inevitable. It comes regardless of whether we want it to come or not. So if we tend to posture ourselves resisting change, we're going to be less able to really process that and, and let God work in us through that. 
I love this verse, and paths that they have not known, I will guide them. And these are paths we have not known. Nobody alive today has gone through a pandemic to the level that we've gone through with the coronavirus. Nobody. So there's lots of people that give advice. There's lots of people who give advice on churches. I get stuff almost daily. Oh, here's what you should do in this. And I delete almost all of them because why? No, they haven't gone through it either. None of us have. We're all trying to figure our way through. So what we need whenever you're in a, in a journey, whenever you're on a journey that you've never been through before, you need a guide. Nobody can guide you except God. He says, I will guide them. You look to God. He'll guide you through this. Nobody else can. Nobody else has been through this. They try to look back at the 1918 uh, flu pandemic. That's different. I mean, it's similar, but it's different. We're in a totally different uh, place in the, in the history of humanity today than we were back then. And so there, certainly there's some life lessons, but we need God to guide us through this. We need God to guide us through this. When the Israelites were in Babylon, I mentioned that earlier with Ezra, they were there and God was using that difficulty to cause them to focus their attention on him, to kind of peel away some of the things that were distracting them spiritually. And so when they came back, for example, one of them was idolatry. When they came back, they never fell into idolatry again. Before that, they, it was, they were on and off, on and off, never again. Why? Because they used that time in, their, in, their, in, in what they went through, that difficulty, to say, God, I don't want to fall into that again. I want to be more fired up for you. I want to be more focused on you. And that's what we all need. Andrew Cuomo in his daily briefings often would say, let's not just go back to the old New York. Let's become better. And that's what we need. We, you, all of us need that. We've gone through this difficulty. Some of us, we need to use this time to fire us back up. Some of us have just been idling on the side of the road. Some of us are in a ditch and God will use this just like he does with a hurricane when a hurricane comes through our area and tree limbs come down and we, it's a mess. But once you clean it up, it's actually those trees have been trimmed away. All of that dead wood, those things that weren't fastened down, they get blown away and it actually can be a positive thing. God can do that in your life. He can use this difficulty if you allow him. Here's a great quote I came across. Many of us don't need to come back to the spiritual place we were at of just going through the motions or no motions at all. We need fresh vision and joy of how God wants to use us. That's actually my quote. But I wanted to emphasize it with a quote because sometimes we listen more, right? Hey, well, who said that? Well, I said that. Let's use this opportunity to really grow. Here's another thing when you're going through change is anticipate upcoming change. That helps bring the frustration down. That helps us to process that when we anticipate it. And let me say, you and I, we need to anticipate things will feel different here at Vineyard when you come back. I want to give you some of the things that we're going to be doing. We'll post these up on the website uh, so you can refer to them. But I want to just kind of prepare you for some of the changes because knowing what's coming will help. So Let's look at some of the things that will be happening. Well, we're going to have our physical services that will begin this coming weekend, June 13th and 14th. We'll still have our online services as we did on our three platforms, which is our Vineyard Church, uh, which is Vineyard Live, and then Facebook and YouTube. And then here's a change. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to still have our Sunday 5.30 service, our Saturday 5.30 service, but Sunday we're going to move our 9.30 to 9. So it'll be 9 a.m. So that's important if that was your service. 9 a.m. We need that extra time to clean. And we thought, well, we want to, we, you know, we just, we need that. So that'll be 9 a.m. and then 11 a.m. Then our Saturday night, 5.30, and our Sunday, 9 a.m., we'll have facial coverings and social distancing is required at all the services. Okay? It's required. Sunday at 11, facial coverings and social distancing is required except for the following exceptions. And here's the exceptions. And this comes from Governor Northam's Executive Order 63, the most recent one, on how churches and really how all businesses, all institutions are supposed to be operating. He says anyone drinking, well, he doesn't say coffee. I added that for us because that's what we, you know, we, we serve coffee, tea. Anyone drinking coffee or eating a bagel, because we serve bagels, uh, 
But he says, anyone drinking or, 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 or eating, they don't need the facial covering. Anyone who has trouble breathing with the facial covering, anyone who has a health condition doesn't have to do it. So if, if that's you, if you're in one of those categories, we have the 11 o'clock service where those exceptions apply so that people can not wear the facial coverings based on uh, the recommendations by our governor. But we wanted to separate those because it's a, we needed a place for people that were most vulnerable, the categories of being older or having health conditions, where they can go and feel safe. That is very, very important. And if you have people that are, have their masks on or don't, for whatever reason, if they don't have their mask on, they could still be COVID positive. And now it's not safe. And so most churches are just, they're not providing that place for them. And so they're just saying, if you're older, you just stay at home. I was with my mom. I told you recently, I called up the pastor of the church that she goes to. And I said, what are you doing for my mother? She's 82. She wants to be able to go to her church. What are you doing as you're reopening? Because uh, they just reopened uh, uh, last week. And he goes, your mom is not our target audience. We're doing nothing for her. Just tell her to stay at home. Well, I was real sad. Certainly my mom was sad to hear that. And And I'm not picking on that church because this is typical. I don't know any church that's doing what we're doing. But we just felt like, hey, what about our older people, our people that are most vulnerable? Is that what we want to do? That's our message. We don't feel that's part of our assignment to just tell them, stay at home for the next year or two until a vaccine is developed. It might be longer. It might be never. We don't, instead, we felt, what can we do that includes them? So we decided we're going to have two services the Saturday night, Sunday at nine, to be facial coverings are required at all times. And then Sunday morning uh, at 11, uh, that, those exceptions that are there. Hey, if that's, you know, and if, if that's, so you have to just decide which one you want to be part of. Certainly if you're, uh, if you're older, you have an uh, uh, underlying health condition, or you attend church with somebody like that, You'll want to come to one of those other services because they, they, we're going to be able to provide the very, very best experience for them there. And we're real proud of that. Those who need to wear facial coverings at all services are staff and dream teamers. That's even at the 11 o'clock the whole time. Uh, auditorium seating will be grouped and cluster seating. So we'll be six feet apart, but there'll be clusters. And here's what the clusters will look like. We're going to have families. Of course, everybody's doing that. But here's what we're doing. Those already gathered together in life. You see, we don't want to single out people that are already single. Maybe they're divorced or their, uh, their, their spouse has died or they, uh, their, their, their husband or wife doesn't come to church or, and then just say, well, you'll sit alone now, six feet apart from everybody for, you know, for who, until things radically change. Again, that didn't sound like a loving, kind way to approach, especially when they're already doing life together in small groups. They're doing life together in in other formats. So if they're already clustered and they're doing life together, they can sit together. They're part of the family. Uh, uh, Then building, we're going to clean the building midweek thoroughly with the company and then also clean it between services. Signs will be posted at the facility entrance, helping people know what to expect. And then we have hand sanitizer stations all over the church. Uh, we already had a lot, but we're, we've added quite a bit more. Building will be at half capacity, six foot distancing between rows in, in the auditorium. And then also we'll do, be doing that in the children and the youth. In the children's ministry, we're going to have uh, children's ministry, all three services. Uh, kids will be required to wear facial coverings again at our Saturday at 5.30, 9 p.m. service, and then no more than 10 per uh, room. When it comes to toddlers, they don't wear facial coverings, so we have a special uh, way of taking care of them. We're going to have rooms set up with tables and activities, but we do need a parent uh, or an older sibling to help with that. We will have hosts in the room, but we'll need uh, some help with that, except for the 11 o'clock, we will have uh, kids' ministry for toddlers as well. We're going to sanitize after every service with our electrostatic sprayer. Uh, we'll have tables for easier social distancing. That's in the kids' room. We'll also be doing temperature checks over the teachers, the kids, and all the, uh, the teachers, the helpers, and the kids so that we know uh, uh, that's just another check there. If somebody does come in with a high temperature, uh, we'll just pray for them, encourage them to go home and get some rest and then no self-check-in. So those are the, some of the things that you can do to anticipate an upcoming change. Then adapt to change quickly. 
Listen, the quicker you can get on board, the better. Uh, and if you want to wait, I, I think that's fine. You need to do what's best for your own conscience. You respond to that. But when you're ready to come back, we, want, we say come in, jump in with both feet, and, and, and get involved again and, and start serving and say, hey, I want to get along doing what God's called me to do. And we encourage you to do that. Jesus says that should be our temperament, really, when it comes to kingdom service. He says that when it comes to serving him, don't look back. Don't, don't always look back at the way things used to be. Start embracing change. He says, Jesus responded, why do you keep looking backwards to your past and have second thoughts about following me? When you turn back, you're useless to God's kingdom. In other words, you're not going to be your very best. Uh, you're not going to be the most productive, the most fruitful. You're not going to be able to do what God's assigned you to do if you're always looking back which change can cause us to want to do. Hey, how great it was in, uh, the, in, in the past. And then lastly, keep focused on what God has for you. What is he doing in this time? I've talked to a number of pastors over these last few months, what they're doing in their churches. There are things they're going to implement, what they're not going to implement. But often in the conversations on Zoom that we have, somebody will bring up, but what's God doing in you? What's God doing in your church? To me, that's always the most profitable part of the conversation. What's God doing in the middle of it? We, we know what there's a lot of crazy stuff happening, but can you see the thread of the Holy Spirit weaving his way, wanting to direct you, wanting to encourage you, nudge you on? Sometimes it takes that, that change, that difficulty to cause you to move forward. Look at this verse here. For I am about to do something new. This is what God says. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? It's easy to miss it. When you're in the middle of change, it's easy to miss it. That's why he says, do you, do you see it or do you not? Jesus used to say, if you have ears, let, then I want you to hear. Listen, he's not talking about your, the, the cartilage on the side of your head. He's talking about, do you have spiritual ears? Can you hear what the Holy Spirit's doing in your life? He goes, I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. No matter how difficult he is, God says, I can do something in the middle to bring life into your life, to change your attitude, to fill your life with joy, to cause you to have purpose once again. And he wants to do that with you. The Bible says in Psalm 42, he says that we are to be like deer that get so thirsty, that our soul thirsts for God, that we'll, we'll go into the heights to look for water to quench that thirst. You see, sometimes when we're down in the valley, we just stay there until we get so thirsty it causes us to go forward and say, God, I need, I need, I need my soul quenched. I need my, my soul ministered to. And some of you, you are in the valley. You've been living there before this coronavirus even started. But now you're just parched and you need an infilling of the Holy Spirit. You need a touch by God. And I want to pray for that. But I also want to challenge you. Take this moment and, and this season in your life and let God do something. Look for the thread of the Holy Spirit in it. Let's pray. God, I just pray right now in Jesus' name that you come and you work through the change. You use the frustrations that come into our lives for your purpose and your glory. Lord, we want to just recognize that change is inevitable. It's going to happen. Help us to anticipate it. Help us to move quickly into it and see your hand in the midst of it. God is speaking to some of you. He's saying, today's your day. Today is the day that you're to get out of idle. You're to get out of the rut. He wants to help you and he wants to retool you, refocus you. God says, I want to fill you with joy. I want to fill you with that perfect peace to know that you're on assignment for him. You say, why don't you pray? Right now, wherever you're at, if you're alone, maybe you can pray out loud. There's something powerful that happens when we verbalize our prayer or just maybe you feel more comfortable praying where you just silently, but God certainly can hear that. Would you just pray and say, God, help me to, if I just need more fuel for my fire, that's what I need. Give that to me. Would you say, God, I'm an idol. I mean, my spiritual life has been in the doldrums for a long time. 
I want you to use this, all of the frustration, all of the difficulty to get me out of that place and get me on mission. And some of you are just in a ditch. You're in a difficult place. You're, you've been stuck and God wants to break you free from that. Would you say, if, if that's you, if you're idling, you're in a ditch, you're in a place where you're far from God, would you say right now, dear God, I want to come back to you. I want to follow you. I want to trust you that you have my best interest in mind. That's a big faith prayer. Would you say that? God, I, I trust you. I follow you because I trust you. Would you say, God, forgive me for my sin, my doing things my own way, falling into my own funk? Would you say, God, save me from those things. Let me learn to trust you. Begin my days looking at what you're going to do in my life. We pray this in Jesus' mighty, mighty name. Amen. Well, God's got some great things. I believe it. I believe God is doing some amazing things in the midst of all of this craziness. And we do live in crazy times, but God uses those things for his purpose and his glory. I want to also tell you, if you've been supporting uh, our, our church during this time, uh, with all the risks, with all the challenges, uh, thank you so much. That is another way that we just say, God, I trust you. You're my source. You're going to provide for me. I don't have to worry about my own needs. And also we get to contribute to the kingdom. I want to give you uh, some ways that if you want to be part of uh, what we're doing here at the church and financially, uh, certainly we, we, we love people praying and serving. One of those ways to contribute is through giving. Uh, you can give on the give button if you're on the Vineyard Church live site. Uh, also, you can text 45777 and then in the uh, the space where you give, just put in VCC and then the amount. And then of course you can give on vineyardchurch.com. Bless you. Thank you so much. I think God's going to do super things. I'm super anticipating some great things in not only this coming weekend, but in this new season uh, in the mission of our church. So see you next week. God bless. Take care.